Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I'm your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope all of you had fantastic weekends. We have got a bevy of stories to address here. Going to dive into them here in a moment. 9-0 Supreme Court rules in favor of Trump slapping down Colorado, Maine, Illinois. What is the significance? I'll break it on down for you. Tennessee goes on the road and beats Alabama. Huge win. Who is going to get the final number one seed in the NCAA tournament as we come up on the final week of the regular season in college basketball. Uh, New York Times, CBS, Wall Street Journal, and Fox News all have Trump in the lead over Biden. What do we think about those? Keith Olbermann uh, calls for the Supreme Court to be dismantled uh, and uh, and thrown uh, torn asunder after he doesn't like their ruling on Trump. Uh, Johnny Manziel weighs in on Reggie Bush still not having his Heisman, says that he will no longer attend the Heisman ceremonies. We will talk about it. Fannie Willis, Nathan Wade, where are we headed? What's the significance? Joe Manchin's bodyguard tosses a climate protester at Harvard. Sydney Sweeney, God bless her, brings boobs back uh, to the forefront. And Caitlin Clark versus Pistol Pete. What do I think about the big college basketball all-time leading scorer story. I will address all of that and more, but we start off with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Over 3 million members, unlike other apps, on Prize Picks, you against the number, no sharks or competitive leagues. You can win up to 100 times your money. Little as four correct picks, you can turn $10 into $1,000, whether it's the tournament, which is going to be starting in a couple of weeks, or the conference tournaments, which start next week in major power conferences going on this week. Uh, Fight for playoff, home court in the NBA, no shortage of high stakes, including big basketball uh, games, but also golf coming up soon. We're going to have the Masters. Get on the excitement with prize picks. Turn your latest hoops knowledge into serious cash. They have something for everybody. Doesn't matter what sport you love, you can get hooked up right now. Uh, Whether you're a big golf guy, big basketball guy, big hockey guy, Major League Baseball season on the horizon, Prize Picks going to allow you to make your picks no matter what sport you love. And you can get hooked up all in the same entry, whether you like Caitlin Clark, uh, Connor McDavid, or Jude Bellingham, all together in the same entry. Get hooked up now. I'll give you some picks later this week. In the meantime, I am telling you right now, download the app. Use the code OUTKICK for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. I'm giving you $100. If you deposit $100, you double your money. Boom, right off the stop, right off the top. PrizePicks.com. Use that code OUTKICK. $100. $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, 9-0. Supreme Court decision. What is the significance here? Uh, first, it is important to set the precedent that individual states do not have the power to remove presidential contenders based on their analysis of the 14th Amendment, in particular, the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Uh, the court says Congress has the power to remove in federal cases, not individual states. It's the most basic level, this is the right call. Because otherwise, what you would see is you'd have 50 different states all making determinations about whether it's red or blue, someone can be on the ballot or not in their state based on a reading of whether they have been engaged in insurrectionary behavior. It would expand. It would be whether they've engaged in impeachable behavior. You know how this would go. This would eventually lead to red states pulling blue uh, candidates off the ballot and blue states, which has already happened, pulling red uh, state candidates off the ballot. You know that this is where things would have led. So the Supreme Court, right off the top, I want to give them credit, 9-0 decision, they got it right. And I would encourage people out there who watch MSNBC or CNN or read the New York Times or the Washington Post, all of those outlets spent years now telling you that it was a foregone constitutional conclusion that it was not permissible for Donald Trump to stay on the ballot. And then the Supreme Court, Democrat and Republican appointees, unanimously came out and said, no, all of these left-wing lunatics are wrong. This is not going to be allowed to happen. 
And I think the Supreme Court got it right. I told you I was hopeful that they were going to rule 9-0. It was evident based on the questioning that this was not going to be a win for the left-wingers, for Colorado, for Maine, for Illinois, for any state that tried to pull Trump off the ballot. And they did it the day before Super Tuesday, 15 different states, including my own Tennessee, going to vote. I always tell you how I'm going to vote. I've said it before, but I'm going to vote in the Republican primary for Donald Trump to be the nominee, and I will vote for Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States. You can agree or disagree with that. I always tell you exactly how I vote. That is how I'm going to vote. Not going to vote for Nikki Haley. Not going to vote for anybody else on the ballot in the Republican primary. I'm going to be voting for Donald Trump. He's going to be the nominee. That's who's getting my vote. Okay? So, important decision 9-0. But also, read the actual opinion for yourself. I encourage you always actually read the documents yourself. Don't just listen to people who share opinions like me. Go read. It's 20 pages. It'll take you 20 minutes. Go read the actual Supreme Court opinion yourself. And if you do that, I think what you'll emerge having read that will be the most interesting to you is not the 9-0 unanimous opinion. I think it's the Supreme Court dissents because they often tell you more about what's really at stake. All nine justices agree Colorado doesn't have the ability to pull Donald Trump off the ballot. 9-0, that's not a question. But how would Donald Trump be pulled off the ballot under Section 3, the 14th Amendment? There's actually a disagreement. And the way that I read the dissent, which again, three justices uh, signed on for part of the opinion and then filed a dissent on it, is how would one be removed from uh, the Supreme Court? Uh, by, how Sorry, how would one be removed from the ballot according to the Supreme Court? The majority opinion, which five justices signed on to, says that it would require two-thirds of Congress to make the decision that someone is not eligible to be on the ballot under Section 3. That is, they engaged in an insurrection. It would be a really high standard equivalent to what's required to remove a sitting president or impeach any member out there, that it would require a two-thirds majority of the Senate uh, and the House acting in concert. That's my reading. The uh, dissenters seem to be arguing that all it would require is a bare majority. That's significant because it's way easier to have a majority than it is to get a two-thirds majority. And the dissenters say we shouldn't even be considering this right now because it's not at issue. The majority went ahead and shut the door. They said, we're not going to get involved in this before it even gets to us. Trump is eligible uh, under Section 3 unless two-thirds of Congress comes out and says he's not eligible, and they went ahead and analyzed that. That, to me, is actually the dispute. There is a segment of the Democrat Party that is going, if Trump wins, they're going to stage their own January 6th, and they're going to claim he's not eligible because he engaged in insurrection. And all the people that told you that January 6th was an unacceptable attack on American democracy are going to dispute Donald Trump's ability to become President of the United States in 2024. That is where they are trying to head. And that's what the dissent, in my opinion, that's what the dissent uh, disagreement actually is. But in the meantime, 9-0 win, big victory for Donald Trump, and I think, frankly, big victory for the United States to ensure that we don't have these banana republic justices. Now, let me also say this. Who are the actual anti-democracy people? Is it people like me who believe that January 6th was a riot and that people who riot, regardless of their political persuasion, should be prosecuted, whether they're rioting for BLM or whether they're rioting on January 6th or whether they're rioting for support of Palestine or whether they're rioting in support of Israel. If you riot, even if you are making a political statement, 
you should be prosecuted, in my opinion. If you block a road, you should be prosecuted, okay? All of that, am I anti-democracy? Or are the people in Colorado, Maine, uh, Illinois, and also huge swaths like Keith Olbermann, who I'm going to talk about in a minute, who don't believe that the American public should be able to vote for the candidate of their choice, isn't that the very definition of anti-democracy? I believe that 150 million plus of you, including myself tomorrow in the primary, that we should be able to go out and decide who we believe our elected leaders should be. Colorado, Maine, Illinois, and many other left-wingers out there on MSNBC and CNN, they don't believe that you should be able to choose the candidate of your choice. That's the very definition of being anti-democracy. And I think that conversation needs to occur more often and more significantly than it actually is right now. And I think it's important for all of you to understand what is really at stake here. Um, and this is, a, uh, this is a big deal. Keith Olbermann tweeted out, um, and I think this is significant. Let me make sure that I, uh, that I pull it up. Uh, Keith Olbermann tweeted, uh, hold on, i got to find it, because Keith Olbermann is a, is a loon, um, and the fact that he is out there making this argument is pretty crazy. Uh, Keith Olbermann tweeted, the Supreme Court has betrayed democracy. Its members, including Jackson, Kagan, and Sotomayor, have proven themselves inept at reading comprehension, and collectively, the court has shown itself to be corrupt and illegitimate. It must be dissolved. I mean... This is where the left is. They, like Keith Olbermann, are arguing that democracy must be preserved by removing the Supreme Court's ability to have any role in our government. That's not democratic. That's the very essence of being in favor of a dictatorship. And I believe, I'm, I'm a history guy. You guys know this. I believe that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, long after Donald Trump and Joe Biden have passed, the precedent set of their tenure will be very important. And I don't think the left is going to look very good in the light of history. They don't look very good in the modern day, in my opinion. But I think they're going to look even worse in the cold light of history and the judgment on history. Because Trump derangement syndrome has led people like Keith Olbermann to a position where they would advocate for the ending of democracy to avoid Donald Trump being able to be in a position of political power. And if you ever end up in that position, where you are so afraid of the person that might be president that you are willing to give up basic democracy principles, you're not in favor of democracy anymore. You're in favor of raw political power being exercised by your side. That's what Keith Olbermann's arguing for. And let me reiterate again. Keith Olbermann has a substantial audience. He's the, sort of the father of MSNBC's left-wing political persuasion. I will debate Keith Olbermann on every issue under the sun, any time, any place, anywhere, from whether dudes should be able to identify as women and compete in sports or whether the Supreme Court was right to hold that Colorado doesn't have the authority under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to do away with Donald Trump's uh, being on the ballot. Any subject under the sun, any time, any place, anywhere with Keith Olbermann, and I think I will sweep the floor with him, and it won't be remotely close. All right, let's dive into some March Madness-related questions. Well, f first of all, let me uh, – I'll pivot. Hold on. New York Times, CBS, Wall Street Journal, Fox News. All of them have 
Donald Trump up two points or more. All of these polls, New York Times, CBS News, uh, the Wall Street Journal, and Fox News, all of them came out uh, over the weekend. What's really at stake here? Uh, I think the story, to me, the story beyond a shadow of a doubt is this is about Joe Biden's increasing unpopularity. 10% of Joe Biden voters in 2020 said in the New York Times poll, they are now willing to vote for Donald Trump. And really, this race right now boils down to this. In October of 2020, Donald Trump had 43% favorable, 54% unfavorable. October of 2020, New York Times view of the candidate, Trump favorable 43 unfavorable 54. What about in February of 2024? The poll that just came out from the New York Times in Siena on Sunday. 44% favorable, 54% unfavorable. Nobody's opinion of Donald Trump has changed in nearly four years. 43 versus 44 favorable, 54 versus 54 unfavorable. Everybody knows what they think about Donald Trump. Nothing has changed in four years, October of 2020 to February of 2024. Everybody's pretty much made up their mind. So why is Trump leading in 24 right now, whereas he was behind in 20? Because people's opinion on Biden have changed. Listen to this. Joe Biden in October of 2020, 52% favorable, 42% unfavorable. When everybody went to vote in 2020, Biden had a plus 10 favorability rating. Donald Trump had a minus 11 favorability rating. So just on the question of, do you like this guy or not? Biden had a 21 point lead. And he translated that into a very narrow victory. What about in 24? Biden now has 38% favorable, 59% unfavorable. So Biden is now minus 21 in favorability. Trump is minus 10. That means Trump is now plus 11 in 2024. Biden in 2020 was uh, plus 20, 20 points. So Biden has gone from up 20 in favorability to now down 11 to Trump. Biden's favorability numbers have collapsed. That's the race. That's the race in its essence. It's really not about Trump. People already made up their mind about Trump. Biden has collapsed. Trump hasn't surged. And that's why my advice to Trump would be make this race a referendum on Joe Biden. They're not really changing their opinions of you. They're changing their opinions of Biden. And Biden can't win with a negative favorability rating now. Grandpa Joe worked. Now people have decided the border, Afghanistan withdrawal, war in Europe, War in the Middle East, crime skyrocketing, inflation skyrocketing. They sold Biden as kind of an empty vessel. He's just an avuncular old grandpa who likes to eat ice cream. Now people see him as incompetent. That's why Trump's winning. It's not that people's perceptions of Trump have changed. They know what they think of Trump. It's that their perceptions of Biden have changed. And that's why 10% of Biden voters are willing to change their mind. And that's why I think if Biden's the nominee, Trump's going to win. I don't think it matters that people are going to spend billions of dollars trying to convince you a different opinion of Trump, a different opinion of Biden. We have two incumbents. Everybody's already made up their mind. I don't think these numbers are going to move very much. Maybe I'll be wrong. And certainly we'll have months to talk about this as we sit here eight months from election day. But I just don't think the money is going to move the numbers very much. There could be some unforeseen issue. COVID arose out of nowhere four years ago. 
I think Trump would have won comfortably if COVID hadn't happened. I think Biden's an accidental president. But ultimately, people have decided they don't like Joe Biden's leadership. And I think that's why Biden is going to lose. I don't think this thing's going to move a lot over the next eight years. <laughs> Sorry, next eight months. Over the next eight years, who knows what might happen. Okay, let's dive into uh, to March Madness some. Uh, Tennessee beat Alabama 81-74 to over the weekend. Biggest, best game of the weekend. Tennessee now has control to potentially win the SEC East. But, uh, the SEC East, the SEC, uh, uh, SEC overall. But... The bigger question going on right now with college basketball is Houston, Purdue, and UConn are three number one seeds. If you look, it would require a real collapse from Houston, Purdue, or UConn for those teams not to be number one seeds. But the question of who should be the fourth number one is very up in the air. Could be Arizona, could be Tennessee, could be North Carolina. There are different teams making the case for why they deserve to be the fourth number one seed. I think Tennessee is going to make that case most soundly if at least they split uh, against South Carolina on Wednesday and Kentucky on Saturday. If Tennessee splits those games, I think it's going to be a hard decision to make. I think people look around and say, man, I don't know which direction we should go here. If Tennessee, if they lose both, Tennessee's not going to be the number one. If Tennessee wins both, this is a no-brainer. Tennessee should be the fourth number one seed along with Houston, Purdue, and UConn, even if they have to get potentially shipped out west. Uh, that would be the thing that makes the most sense. Uh, so that is my analysis of the bigger picture of college athletics right now as we come into March Madness, who's that fourth number one seed? I think the door is open for it to be Tennessee. If Tennessee can go one and one or two and oh, that would require either four wins against top 25 teams down the stretch or three and one loss. I think Tennessee would be your fourth number one. They would have a better resume than Arizona does. The Pac-12 is just not very strong. The SEC is going to get seven teams in. Pac-12 looks like it's going to get two teams in, and that's even assuming that Arizona beats USC and UCLA uh, final two games that they have out there. A lot of people reacting uh, to Caitlin Clark setting the all-time NCAA scoring record uh, and beating Pistol Pete Maravich's all-time men's scoring record. Caitlin uh, Clark, a lot of fun to watch, uh, is uh, very entertaining. I give her a lot of credit. She's made people care about Iowa women's basketball more than they care about the NBA uh, sometimes. That's a tremendous credit to her. But I don't really see these as even comparisons because when Pistol Pete played, there was no three-point line. So I don't know why everybody's comparing the two. If there was a three-point line, Pistol Pete would have scored a 1,000 more points based on the study that I saw. They didn't put in the three-point line until like 1985 or 1986. It's really not fair to compare point totals when it might make sense for centers or big men who only typically score down low and aren't taking shots outside, but Caitlin Clark owes a huge percentage of the points that she has scored to the shooting range that she has, to her credit. But Pistol Pete would have been completely uncatchable to say nothing of the fact that he only played three years. He would have never been catchable by anyone if there had been a three-point line when he played. And I think that's such a significant change in the same way that you got an asterisk uh, with Roger Maris versus Babe Ruth based on the addition of games, it feels to me like any scoring record that is being compared to a pre-three-point uh, uh, era should have an asterisk beside it. Because, again, if Pete Maravich was a center and he was only scoring inside, I would say, okay, the game hasn't changed that much. He was a guard. And he took a ton of shots that would have otherwise been three-pointers. And it's not the same sport at all. And that doesn't even consider men's versus women, the fact that these are not similar sports necessarily, right? Um, now, 
I still think, say, comparing how many wins Gino Ariyama has in women's basketball to how many wins Coach K has is fairer, even though those are different sports, than comparing point totals for any era. Now, LeBron just scored 40,000 points. Everybody's talking about it. Well, LeBron made a lot of three-pointers. I think it matters what era you played in and if the players before you were in that era played in a different era where you didn't even have a three-point line. That seems very significant to me, and I hear very few people talking about it. Um, Johnny Manziel. Johnny Manziel came out over the weekend, and I give him credit for this, and said he would not show up at the Heisman ceremony until the Heisman Trophy uh, Trust gave Reggie Bush back the Heisman Trophy. I think he's 100% right about this. I have said this on the Fox College football pregame show. I have written it. I've talked about it for years. Reggie Bush should get his Heisman Trophy back. Nothing that he is accused of doing, accepting pay for play, is the very foundation of the sport itself right now. Most players that are elite were paid when they played, whether it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. The investigation into Reggie Bush's family getting a nicer place to live does not change anything about the way that Reggie Bush played on the field. The fact that the Heisman has stripped him of the Heisman is indefensible. I give credit to Johnny Manziel. I would ask any other Heisman Trophy winner, and I know a bunch of them well, Eddie George, Matt Leinart, among them, that this is something that I would encourage them to join. I know Johnny a little bit. I would encourage other Heisman Trophy winners not to participate until the Heisman Trophy announces it's going to do what's right and they return Reggie Bush his Heisman Trophy. Um, I think that's just the right call. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, maybe I'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow because I've already gone on for some time on a lot of these issues. I'm going to talk about Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade and the standard that the judge has to apply uh, going forward about whether he's going to apply the appearance of impropriety as the standard, in which case there's no way on earth that Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade can remain on the Georgia Donald Trump case, or whether he's going to apply the actual conflict standard. That is a higher standard to apply. To me, the appearance of impropriety is enough, but I will talk about that in detail tomorrow uh, because ultimately that's the decision the judge is going to have to apply uh, in the Donald Trump case going forward. Uh, two more stories that I have out here. Did you see Joe Manchin bow up to a climate protester who personally insulted him? Uh, we can probably, in the short form of this show, we can clip it and put it out there uh, for everybody to be able to react to. Uh, but if you watched this, Joe Manchin is in at Harvard. There's still people wearing masks at Harvard because they're a bunch of losers uh, that are never going to actually pay attention to science. Um, and Joe Manchin is there, and this guy insults him. And Manchin stands up, and his bodyguard just grabs the climate protester and tosses him right out of the room. Now, I will bet there ends up being a lawsuit about this. But I'm going to be honest with you. This actually made me like uh, Joe Manchin more. Uh, I don't dislike Joe Manchin at all now. He's a really good college football player. I think we probably have uh, an enjoyable time drinking beers and talking uh, college football in general. He seems, Joe Manchin, like a pretty decent dude. Uh, but when I saw the protester who had insulted Joe Manchin personally just get tossed like a rag doll out the door, I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, finally... I want to give credit, talk about videos. Maybe we can clip this as well. One of the craziest things that has happened, and I've seen it since I started OutKick, uh, one of the craziest things I've ever seen happen, and I continue to believe it's staggering, which is why OutKick has the success that it does. Um, when you actually look, men haven't changed, right? Men like sports, beer, and pretty girls. 
Now, there are other things men like, but overwhelmingly, men like those three things. Sports, beer, pretty girls. There are other things men like. Making money, figuring out how to take care of your family, raising children, right? I've got three boys. I saw Jason Kelsey's comments about the most important thing you do is be a dad. I think about that a lot when it comes to raising my three boys. But as you kind of like break all this down, the idea that it became unacceptable that a company like Bud Light would decide, hey, we need to go after men pretending to be women and we need to turn our backs on football, beer, and pretty girls is a sign of how broken society became. And I look now at the rise of Sydney Sweeney. I don't know Sydney Sweeney at all. I've never watched Euphoria. She is a pretty actress. There are lots of pretty actresses out there. There always have been. There always will be. As a general rule, and I know this will stagger you, people who are actors and actresses tend to be better looking than people who are not actors and actresses. Whether it is Brad Pitt or whether it's Sidney Sweeney, generally speaking, Tom Cruise, Denzel Washington, people want to watch on the big screen people who are better looking than them. This is the history of film, right? And guess what? Film often rewards good-looking women who sometimes, look at the history of James Bond, put on bathing suits and look incredible in those bathing suits. You'll remember, those of you who've been watching me for a long time, I got banned for life, at least so far, by CNN for saying, only two things I believe in 100% are the First Amendment, that is, you should be able to say whatever you want to say, and I should be able to say whatever I want to say, and boobs. They're the only two things that have never led me astray. That clip is viral. Tens of millions of you have seen it. I went on uh, with uh, CNN, Brooke Baldwin back in the day, who Buck tells me I would like. I've never met Brooke Baldwin face-to-face. Uh, but Sydney Sweeney hosted SNL this weekend. And her top, which featured ample cleavage, has gone mega viral. And it seems to me, Joe Kinsey at OutKick has made this argument, but I think there's a lot of truth to it, that Sidney Sweeney is just saying, hey, I'm not going to pretend. I'm just making hot chicks great again. I'm going to wear boob tops. I'm going to post photos that show my boobs, and I'm going to look amazing, and I'm going to make a ton of money. And guess what? Congratulations, Sidney Sweeney. First Amendment and boobs. It ain't ever going out of style. It's never going to fall apart. Not as long as I am alive. Not as long as OutKick exists. God bless you, Sydney Sweeney. I loved your SNL hosting. If you haven't seen the clip and you need a little bit of positivity in your life, Sydney Sweeney's top will make your life a little bit better. By the way, while I'm talking about it, Instagram only exists for hot chicks. If you took hot chicks off of Instagram, the entire business of Instagram would collapse. That's like 95% of their market value. So this whole world this that we've created where we pretend that men don't like good-looking women or we don't recognize when a woman has incredible boobs, it's all BS. You know it. I know it. Every woman on the planet knows it. Sydney Sweeney isn't doing anything that hasn't existed for the history of mankind. The First Amendment and boobs. Embrace both. God bless America. DBAP unless you need to SBAP. I am Clay Travis. This has been OutKick the Show.